Um, so let's start it. So today, we're gonna, so we were talking about motif representations and simple motif discovery method based on the aperture metric. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about um, this biophysical type way of, of, of quantifying protein DNA interaction and then how you build on that to get at the transcriptional network uh, level. And we'll be talking about not only uh, you know, the motifs, but also how active the transcriptive factors are. We started talking about it a little bit. It matters whether that protein is in a nucleus or not, or whether it's phosphorylated or not, you know, all that stuff. And we can actually, it's hard to measure um, activities of transcriptive factors, but we can infer somehow how active they are from their predefined targets in the genome. So is that way of thinking that we'll be following? Um, and, uh, and then finally, I'll end with um, uh, a segment where we're adding a third layer that is genetic variation in the genome sequence that drives variation in the RNA levels. Uh, and then how you incorporate information, prior information about the transcriptional networks, like what are the targets of transcriptive factors Y and Z, right, in, in interpreting the variation and, and detecting these uh, kind of genetic associations uh, with more statistical power. But we're going to start out with the, with the, the basics. We're going to build up step by step. Um, now, we're all like bioinformaticians, you know, mm -hmm. even if you do experiments. And I don't know where you've heard about Plato's cave. This is Plato's cave. Uh, we're prisoners, and we're chained to the floor. It's cold and damp. Um, and, you know, we would like to go out in the bright sunlight and directly observe the protein DNA interactions and all these variables that we're interested in, but sadly we cannot. You know, we need to use all these kind of indirect assays. Uh, and it's not like high throughput methods are more indirect than classic methods. For instance, if you run a gel, right, you're, you know, whatever you're doing, you're separating these molecules by length, you're going from like a microscopic thing to a macroscopic thing. It's also indirect, right? And, and you could almost argue that high throughput methods are more direct measurements as the technology becomes more refined and, and small scale. But there's no way of escaping in most cases um, to do some kind of inference where you start from the data right, that you have. Um, to work with the pointer you have, not the one you wish. Oh, here we go. It's working. Yeah. Um, but, uh, right, so no matter what the data is, even if it's like in vitro protein DNA interaction, um, then it will, uh, you know, you still require some modeling and, and deconvolution, uh, right? Actually, it's deconvolved, not deconvolved. <coughs> Just there, remember that. <laughs> and it's also quantified, not quantitative. I'm just trying as a physicist, right? but that's better. So now we're uh, moving on to. Uh, Next slide. Chaco and Mono, who are really, they got the Nobel Prize for figuring out the mechanism of dynamic regulation of gene expression. Uh, right? And um, the lac operon captures the two aspects of, of, of regulation that I'll be you know, going into a lot of depth uh, about. On the one hand, you got this repressor protein that binds to its operator in the DNA. It's a specific sequence preference, right? And it binds very specifically to that place in the genome because it needs to control this opera, this set of genes that needs to be activated if you run out of uh, lactose. But, you know, um, there's then the metabolite that's being sensed by the transcription factor, and it's only active in the right conditions, right? So on the one hand, we have the sequence specificity of the DNA binding protein, but also its activity, whether or not it switches on its target genes, depends on the cellular conditions. So if you consider that these would be cells from the, the same body, same <laughs> DNA sequence, right? Uh, but you know, this of course is a neuron, and this is uh, the blood cells and the fibroblast, right? They look very different, right? They behave very differently. They respond very differently to external uh, perturbations, uh, but they have the same DNA, right? So we're missing something in terms of the information needed to re describe what, what is going on in these cells. Uh, it's not just a genome sequence that, uh, that we need. We need some information on top of that. And you know, it's in a general sense that's epigenetic information. Anything you know that's not captured by the genetic sequence itself is epigenetic. Um, more recently, that epigenetics has really become like a buzzword associated with histone modifications and DNA methylation, right? But I think about epigenetics also as like condition-specific nuclear concentration of the chip effect. Or anything you need to, to capture the difference between these different cell states, even if their genome sequence, you know, in the nucleus is the same. 
right? And so we have to solve some kind of general problem uh, uh, in, in systems biology going from structure to function, right? And you know, in the days of protein folding, for instance, you know, you could say we have a sequence, right? You want to predict the 3D structure of the uh, of the protein, the protein folding uh, problem. Um, if you think about genomics, you really have the genome sequence, right? And you're trying to predict or understand how, why you have a certain expression level at a, at a given gene, right? Ultimately, in terms of the, the genome sequence and the fact that different genes have different promoter regions, have different 3' UTRs. So they, they respond to all these regulatory epigenetic variables in a unique way because they have a unique set of regulatory uh, non-coding sequences. Right, and then if you go even further up, if you look across a population, for instance, right, there is uh, this problem of genetic variation in the genome between individuals, right, that drives genetic differences between individuals, uh, you know, at the level of RNA levels or, or protein levels, etc. Right, all kinds of downstream uh, things, and ultimately, you know, traits that you would care about, drug response or, or height or, or you know, uh, any kind of thing that you could measure. Any kind of trait, right? So then it's a problem of finding the loci in the genome that are determining these the variation in, in these traits across the population. So we'll we'll be focusing on all that at the same time. Right? So if you go from like a protein folding problem to the the, the, the cell wide problem of systems biology, you could, you could say uh, that uh, uh, you know systems biology is something like a nucleus folding problem. We don't have just one protein, right? We have this mixture of all these proteins that have different concentrations. And we need to, to predict how this all assembles, driven by non-covalent interactions. It's a kind of self-organized structure that then gives rise to, to a particular phenotype or expression point. So if you think back to those different cell types that all have the same DNA, um, you, know, you can really make this distinction between epigenetic and the genetic level pretty crisp. There's on the one hand, there's the genome sequence. Right, which is static, so it's, it doesn't change in time. Of course, it changes on evolutionary time scales, but it doesn't change at the time scale of like a drug response, or, or even mostly at the, over a lifetime of an individual. But there are, of course, changes in um, Right, but then what it does is it defines the connectivity of the molecular network. For instance, if you have a binding site in some genes promoter, right, if you have a point mutation in a binding site, that will change how that know, a particular transcription factor may bind to that promoter and that will change the, the, the outlook. So that's a kind of a cis mutation, right? An aspect of the genome sequence that determines uh, the strength of, of binding sites, for instance. That's one type of connectivity that's defined by the genome. The other kind of connectivity is the protein sequence of proteins, for instance, that bind to DNA. There's all these large families of, of transcription factors, for instance, of, especially zinc fingers, of which there are thousands, but also helix, helix or homeodomain factors, right? And and they all have a unique role in a cell. That's why they're being conserved, you know, you know alongside all these family members. Um, and that is because they, their amino acid sequence makes them behave in a unique way in this regulatory network. It could be in terms of the downstream genes, so the DNA binding domain. And you know, of course, amino acid mutations at the, protein, at the DNA binding domain are so effective will change the way it binds across the genome, right? So that's another way in which the genome uh, defines connectivity by varying the protein sequence of the transacting factors. Or it could be protein-protein interactions. That you want. Okay, so anyway, that's all you know, obvious in a way, right, the gene sequence. And then we have these external and internal cues and signals, you know, that relay by signaling uh, pathways um, that are dynamic and they're at cell state specific. Right? And you know, of course, differentiation is complicated. You go from from the stem cells to, to all these different types of differentiated cells, which is an essentially nonlinear thing where you have fixed points and you know bifurcations and all that stuff. But once you're in a in a particular cell state, understanding how that you know the the um, how that particular cell type responds to external signals, maybe you can get away with linear models better than you know trying to understand differentiation itself. So so it's kind of a motivation for for at least trying to see how far you can get with linear models, which is a lot of what we'll be talking about. But a linear model, would that not be very good at taking into account stochastic elements? And they affect differentiation? The fact that just sometimes this happens and sometimes that happens? 
That's true, but then if you right, you roll down one minimum in some kind of energy landscape or another, right, to have two minima, you you cannot do that with a line, right? So that, that's all. I mean, right? So you need some kind of feedback. Okay, now in a lot of work we do in in my lab, and I think you know the field as a whole is also moving more more in this direction. Is we take a <coughs> a trans factor centric point of view, so we focus on um, DNA binding, and also, you know, Christina Lesk actually this afternoon is going to be talking a lot about post transcriptional regulation by RNA binding proteins, right? Um, and it's a very natural level to try and capture these differences between cell types or cell states, because all the information about the environment that the cell receives, right, in order to reach the, the gene expression level and, and ultimately the phenotype, it has to pass through this bottleneck of these transactic. They're the kind of the middleman, you know, more aggressive stuff, right? So if you want to put numbers on things, uh, this is a good level because this, you know, these are the, the kind of bottleneck uh, variables, right? That nicely separate the upstream events from the downstream events. So, so we've been focusing a lot on just characterizing uh, for shipper factors, and, and there's two aspects really of them. This just shows uh, the 3D structure. This is from a heroic. Uh, 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 Crystal structure of, of this is actually from the yeast. It's uh, mating factors uh, in complex with MCM1. MCM1 is the, uh, the ortholog of serum response factor in, in human, right? Uh, it's a dimer. So you were talking about you know, palindromes, and these are usually dimers. This is a homo dimer of, of uh, MCM1 with itself, the yellow chain <coughs> and the orange chain here. So the same protein is just if you rotate this thing, you map the yellow one to the orange one. Um, right, there's a dimerization domain here, these beta sheets, and then these alpha helices with uh, you know, the amino acids that are not shown here that stick out from these alpha helices interact with the DNA, either the backbone phosphates or the, the which and the backbone phosphates pr pr provide the affinity, right? It just makes the binding stronger regardless of the base sequence. But then there's also these specific contacts with base pairs that make the modulate the strength of the binding depending on what the DNA sequence. Uh, these um, these factors alpha two, uh, they're actually uh, uh, homeo domains. This is a helix turn helix motif. So now this is a different way of designing it, but still there's this alpha helix here that's close to the DNA and it's kind of reading out of the, uh, the, the sequence. Of the DNA. And there's dozens of different families of transcription factors. Some are huge, some are moderately large, some have just a few members, right? And they're although the Families are very different in prokaryotes and in eukaryotes. Almost all the families um, that occur in human are conserved in yeast. Right? So these proteins, you know, you could easily find a, a, prote a protein that's as close in, in structure and sequence between some human gene and some yeast gene as two parallels within human. Right? So, um, so there's, of course, you know, uh, the way chromatin is organized in human is more complicated, right? Much more with domains and all that. But at this level of individual proteins or small complexes of proteins interacting with DNA, things are very analogous between lower single cell eukaryotes like yeast and, and you know, multicellular organisms like human. Also, want to point out, because I'll be talking about this a little bit more uh, in a couple of days when we talk about epigenetics, that you know, what, is, what is this part of the DNA called, this space over here? Is that? Yeah, the major group, right. And then what is what is going on? What is this part called? The minor group. The minor group, right. Most people focus these days on, on you know, recognition through the major group. That seems, right, that's what mostly has been on people's radar screen. There's a bit of a renaissance of, of worrying about interaction with the minor group. Uh, and there's actually specificity in the minor group. I mean, the reason historically where people are mostly focused on the major group is that there's less variation in the hydrogen bond donor accepted pattern in a minor group, right, between the bases. So you think that you cannot let that, you cannot really discriminate between different DNA base sequences by looking at hydrogen bonding patterns in a minor group. But it turns out that variation in the width of the minor group and how that focuses the charge of the backbone phosphates and creates like an electrostatic pocket for arginine and lysine, uh, which are the charged amino acids, that that is actually can have like a tenfold or larger effect on protein DNA. Um, right, so again, this is just a typical 
example of, of a, of a multi-protein complex, which involves both homodimers, or it could also be heterodimers, for instance, June and FOS, AP1, it's a heterodimer of two EZIP family members, right? Uh, it's a you wouldn't be able to tell from the structure, but then the detailed amino acid sequences of those uh, two monomer units in that kind of heterodimer. <coughs> Right? But then they form these higher order complexes. And of course, there's also nucleosomes and all that. Now, we're going to blissfully ignore all that complexity, at least this afternoon, right? Um, and, and just try to pretend that every triple factor just interacts with DNA by itself, and it doesn't really talk to its neighboring. Of course, it's a gross uh, simplification, but um, and it's it wouldn't be tolerable to do that if you would want to make predictions of for individual genes, right? How much they respond. But if you want to get some kind of rough estimate of what the targets of a particular factor are uh, given the promoter sequence, and then you want to infer like a global parameter like an activity of a particular factor in a particular cell type, it's actually okay to get, uh, you know, to, to you can get away with these kind of simple models. Okay, so let's you know, talk about some cartoon uh, questions so far. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you go back? Sure. Just, uh, so in this case, you would have interaction in three points, right? Between the DNA and the... Uh, yeah, although... The death uh, of the sphere, and also on the sides. Right, so you say the three points are here, the green, yellow, yeah. and... Right, that's true, although, the, you know, this there's, there's alpha helix, the base pairs that are close to the amino acid residues coming off this alpha helix, kind of are overlapping with the ones that are close to this protein and this and then, so essentially, all these base pairs, all the way from over here to over here, are all being sensed by at least one or maybe two amino I mean, acid side chains of this of this factor. So, in terms of like motif, this, right. for example, this would be like few base pairs. Yeah, well, this could be. Uh, you know, right you, you, you can see here. The, you see, look at the edge of the base pairs here, right? So that's kind of the unit. So, so this is about a 20 base pair piece of DNA. Uh, this is a big complex, right? It's very specific. Uh, but, um, and it has to do with the nature of the system of the mating uh, system. But, but, the, but the typical eukaryotic electroship effect will, will interact over six, seven, eight, nine base pairs. Right? But then they can also bind in combinations and, and read uh, 15 positions. OK, so cartoon, this is a, a chromosome. The yellow box is Chromatin, it's a mysterious the ether of the, definitely the 20th century now. We're starting to measure the ether, right? And uh, in the in the ENCODE project, with the instant modifications, so it's no longer as mysterious. It's just you know phosphate groups and all that stuff that gets recognized by specific histone till binding proteins. Right? But with chromatin, until definitely until like 10 years ago, it was uh, with some exceptions, was largely this mysterious you know substance that you could attribute anything strange that would you know, happen to. Uh, Right, but we're really starting to understand it, but I'm still ignoring it here. Um, right? So you have a cis-regulatory element. So this is a stretch of DNA, and of course I'm only showing one strand here, but there's the second strand, it's double-stranded DNA. And let's say that this is a, a base sequence that my proship effector likes to bind to. Right? Now, it's not enough to have this motif in the genome for this gene to get expressed. Right? I need It's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. What, what I need is I need this precipitate the protein to be present in the nucleus because this is all happening within the nucleus, right? Um, and a typical precipitate has at least two domains, a uh, DNA binding domain, right, that recognizes this motif. At least it binds to this kind of motif more strongly than other motif, motifs that, you know, that um, typically. And then there's this activation domain that interacts with some component of the polymerase complex, right, that mediates an interaction between complex, which then in turn, you know, brings this DNA close to Paul 2, brings Paul 2 close to DNA. The textbook image is that you have this promoter and then Paul 2 gets brought in from somewhere, right? But actually, probably the most accurate picture is that there, Paul 2 is sitting in these foci, specific 3D places in the, in the nucleus um, that are called, some people talk about transcription factories, right? And they're actually surrounded by multiple uh, transcription factors. And then they could recruit different loops of DNA from the surrounding uh, chromatin, right, to get brought close to the pole. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is that 
the DNA, but the start side of this gene is brought physically close to the Paul II complex. Um, and then it will contribute to the transcription of this gene. And Paul II is just one of several molecular machines that, you know, whose recruitment is orchestrated by these DNA binding factors in a both a sequence and a, a condition specific way. Again, the condition specificity comes from the fact where it is there or not, and what concentration is this protein present in. And so there's a chromatin modifying uh, complexes or histone pill modifying enzymes, right? And they're all <coughs> recruited to specific locations by specific contributors. Right? So Paul II is not always the bottleneck for initiating contribution. You also have to prepare the protein for, for transcription. Okay, so if you take this thing that I had earlier about the two aspects, the two levels of information in the cell, the static and the dynamic regulation, and then you apply this to, you know, this transcription factor molecule <coughs> level, you could say there's two aspects of transcription factor function. On the one hand, there's the specificity of the DNA binding domain that we need to quantify. And there's also the condition-specific regulatory activity. It boils down to a concentration in the nucleus, but that's not the whole story because it also matters where the, it has the right personalizational modifications, you know, it could be inactive with the wrong combination of, uh, um, uh, of uh, modifications, and also something like um, binding of small molecules, like steroid hormones, for instance, could you know change have an allosteric effect that change is whether the factor is active or not. Could, for instance, you know, open up the activation domain, uh, which is the case for steroids. So. What we want to know in case of the specificity, we want to put numbers like relative KBs, the one I talked about on the right side on the right, on different DNA sequences, right? This big lookup table of relative binding affinities. That's what I would like to know about the factor. And then um, the other thing is I'd like to know the condition specific regulatory activity. But that's very hard. If I would GFP label a trip factor that would quantify nuclear uh, concentration, still I wouldn't get information about the post translational modification state, for instance, right? So it turns out that actually the best way to get information about the bottom line activity of a regulator DNA binding factor is to look at the mRNA level of its targets, right? Because that's easy to measure. You have lots of parallel measurements, so which includes multiple targets of the trigger factor. And somehow by comparing the changes in the RNA levels of the known targets of the factor with the changes in other genes, you know, doing some kind of t-test based thing, but now with the regular right, set of targets of the transcription factor instead of the go category. Uh, you, that's one way, that's kind of a rough way of getting at this. And, um, and so mostly what I'm building up towards is a more refined way of doing this that uses linear regression that recognizes that there's a continuum of strengths of binding sites, and there's a continuum of response strengths, right? And you want to relate those two. If you have a promoter with a weak binding site, it will respond weakly to an increased nuclear concentration of the factor, if you have a strong binding site, it will respond more strongly. Yeah. So and this is a B-zip factor, like June and Foss dimer, um, right? And it's two long alpha helices, part of which are, you know, do protein-protein interaction, and then these ends, they're going into a major groove and they're reading the, the sequence of the DNA. Right? And, and you see, this is one of the sequence logos that you now produced, you know, this morning with this GAT and motifining uh, algorithm. Um, what, what category of motifining algorithm was that, by the way? Were you aware? We talked about the two general classes of motifining algorithm. One that would give you, say, the Tata box, if, if it was true that every gene had a Tata box. Right. So what, what was the set of sequences that you would try? Was it using all the sequences, or was this? Using all the sequences. I think it was just the, right, the sequences that were about. So it was a subset, and then look for something that's enriched in that, uh, in that subset. Okay, and here, you know, I was already saying this uh, to some extent. The regulatory activity depends on lots of things. You know, one thing, approach that was popular up to about five years ago, and we kind of, you know, tried to alert people that this is not a good idea, is uh, to use the mRNA level of the gene that encodes the transcription factor protein as a measure for its activity, right? You're building networks and you can say, look across lots of conditions, you have the mRNA level of a, of, of a transcription factor gene and then correlated with its targets, right? 
it, it's, it works definitely for some cases, but if the activity is really regulated at the uh, transcriptional level, but the main you know, area where that works well is, say, in early development, when you have these, you know, these very predictable cascades of activation of transcription factor during early development, you know, with ox genes and parallel genes and all that, right? Um, there, you want to have the slow uh, transcriptional step to kind of time the development. And all that. Um, if you're a mature, fully differentiated cell, and, and you're mostly trying to uh, keep things the same, right, and kind of epistatic response to external <coughs> perturbations, then you want to act quickly, typically, right? And uh, uh, going through transcription is a slow step. is not typically the best way of doing it. You want to <coughs> use post-translational uh, control of, of these transcription factors. For instance, having it sitting out there in the cytoplasm, ready to go into the nucleus if the time is right. And, you know, if you get a signal, the receptor would very quickly uh, make that protein move to the nucleus without having to wait for it to become an mRNA and a protein. Okay, so I think it's good whenever you're analyzing expression data, chip data, etc. to always keep in mind the kind of mechanistic chain of events, right? Like what's really happening with the molecules inside the cell? What, you know, what is just correlation and what is causation? Um, and so I think one useful way to think about you know, what I just talked about as some kind of sequence of mechanistic events is this whole chain of sequence, the like genome sequence, which you have to think like a the binding side in some order, right? Um, now, if you look at the genome sequence, um, you could see it as a string of A, C, Gs, and Ts, right? That's how we see it in a fasting file, for instance, right? But the transcription factor doesn't see the sequence. It just sees a, a KD landscape, right? Or maybe an on and an off rate landscape. But it, it's, right, it's, it's, it sees the genome sequence as a kind of affinity landscape, where affinity is different for every base pair position. Also, Different transcription factors see the same genome in different ways, right? So there's like a thousand different views on the on the genome from the point of view of each individual transcription factor, and that's why they contribute unique uh, things to the, the functioning of the cell. Okay. And so this is this static, uh, because you know both the DNA binding domains, you know, roughly speaking, are static, and also the non-coding region in the genome are static. Right? But then the cell type specific element comes in as the concentration, which is cell type specific. So what I'm coloring here blue is of the hidden variables, the properties of the transcription factor that we would like to quantify when we're analyzing RNA expression data in particular. Right? Um, we'd, we'd like to, of course, this problem of going from sequence to affinity is is an in vitro problem. Right? We just want to characterize the DNA binding domain. So we could use protein binding microarrays or high version of CELEX, which actually Todd will give a talk about it later. And um, right, to, uh, to quantify the, you know, the specificity of factors, but then this is, of course, cell type dependent. We want to have some way of putting a number on how active this factor is. And then, you know, together, the specificity and the concentration determine the fractional occupancy of a binding site in the genome. So what fraction of the time is this site binding site? From 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 percent. Right? And that gets back to this thermodynamic model that, that uh, I'll try to use a dark mark. Right? So I was writing this on-off thing on the board. K on, K off. And then we wrote down this kind of stationary equation for uh, you know when you have as much production of bound complex through binding and you know loss of bound complex through unbinding and then the uh, result of that is that the concentration of the DNA protein complex divided by the free DNA concentration right so this, this is not what we want yet. This is not what fraction of the DNA is bound by the protein, right? This is just what is the ratio of the, right? If, there's, if it's 50-50, if this ratio is 1, then you'll have 50% occupancy, right? And this steady state condition gave you this equation of, you know, free protein concentration divided by the KD, which has dimension of concentration as well. Uh, 
you know, as a function of whatever the sequence is, right, the DNA sequence that we have. So again, if the, the free protein concentration is equal to the KDE, then there's as much DNA that's taken up in a DNA protein complex as there is free DNA. So now if we want to know the fractional occupancy, so let's call it OCK or something, right? I'll be calling it N in the slides, I think. Okay? This asks what fraction of the total DNA is, is bound in a complex, right? So it's this is a fraction of the total DNA concentration, which is the sum of the bound DNA and the free DNA. Right. Okay, now I can rewrite this and just divide by the free DNA concentration. And what I get is the, oops. I get concentration of the complex divided by free DNA concentration over that same ratio, right, because I have the same term here, plus 1, because this I divide by the same thing. Now I can use this, right, I say I have these things that I don't know, right, uh, but here if I would know the KE and I would know the free protein concentration, right, I could actually compute the fractional occupancy. So now I get free protein concentration over the KB, and then divided by the same thing, right? I've made this substitution, this substituted by this at both these places, right? Plus one. And now I multiply by the KB again. Uh, and um, I get free protein concentration over free protein concentration plus KD. I could do one more step. I could actually divide by the KD and 1 over the KD, uh, I should make sure my D looks different from my A, we call that the association concept. KD was the off rate divided by the on rate. KA is the on rate divided by the K. If I divide, basically, if I multiply by KA everywhere, KA times KD is one, right? Because there is other reciprocal. So then I get protein concentration, free protein concentration, times the KA for that sequence, right? Or the protein DNA interaction, plus one. Or actually, well, let me write. It. Free protein concentration times Ka plus one. Now, there's a couple of things here. If the protein concentration is equal to the Kd, I get one divided by two, right? I get 50%. So just validating that. You know, if the protein concentration is equal to Kd, you get 50% of the time you get a binding. This is average over time, right? In reality, this protein will come up and on the DNA all the time. But on average, if you take either a time average over a single cell, or you take an ensemble average over a whole bunch of cells, right? In the test that you're measuring something across lots of individual cells, right? you get this kind of statistical average that this equation models. Right? The other thing is, you know, if the concentration is low, relatively low, it means that this term is not important compared to the one over here, right? And basically what you get is just that occupancy is proportional to the free protein concentration. Right? It's just that the stronger sites have a higher slope. What, what, what is the word, the English word for whatever this term does? Binding at high concentration, binding gets saturated, right? So it models the saturation. It's really self-competition. It's this protein molecule that's trying to bind to DNA is competing not with itself but with another you know, uh, clone of the same protein. Right? In solution there's lots of different proteins. Right? And so saturation is some kind of self-competition. Of course you could also have competition with other proteins. Right? And you could model this in principle with the same kind of thermodynamic. Okay, so basically this equation right, that occupancy or N right, on average 
equals this thing. Right? That's really how those two blue things come together in the occupancy. So that how it depends on the sequence through the Ka of the protein DNA interaction for that specific sequence. And on the cell state through the concentration in the nucleus of this, uh, of this transcriptive. Right? So the concentration here, if you think of this as our model for gene expression regulation, right? if you say this one binding site controls the expression of the gene, maybe transcriptional activation is proportional to the fraction of time this thing is bound, then the cell type specificity comes in through the free protein concentration. And the gene specificity comes in through the Ka of the binding site. You also see here that it's really only the product of these two that matters, right? So it doesn't really matter whether your binding site is 10 nanomolar or 100 nanomolar, right? Because it's all in relation to the concentration of the protein. You could all make the, all the binding sites twice as weak, but then you could have double the protein concentration, and you would still have the same regulatory network uh, state. Now. Once we, we have some, you know, the fractional occupancy, that determines something like a transcription rate, or if you're talking about an RNA binding, protein binding to the 3 and the turnover rate of an mRNA transcript. But it's important that what occupancies determine is the rate at which some other enzymatic process like transcription occurs, right? It doesn't directly determine something like a steady state RNA concentration. It only you control things through the rates. It's like steering the Titanic or something, right? It takes a while for, for it to, to turn. So, so you'll never have an immediate response to these variables like this protein concentration, but you will start to then change in, in the direction of lowering your RNA um, or, or increasing your, uh, your RNA. Right? And then, of course, you know, whatever the cell does, it depends on the steady state level of proteins and RNA. Right, which are all coming from combinations of, of rates of like creation and, and turnover of those molecules. And then ultimately, you know, there's fitness and selection and it kind of feeds back to the sequence level, but we're not going to deal with that. Here, right? It's all about short time scales and not evolutionary questions. Any questions about this? Okay, so, so what I will be talking about is um, Kind of a general way of trying to explore, exploit the the variation that exists uh, from gene to gene, right? This is not so much about the variation in the population; it's another layer. But even if you talk about just one cell line, you know it's genome sequence, right? Um, you know that every gene feels the same kind of cocktail of, of chip effect in the nucleus, right? It's just that they respond to it differently uh, because they have different promoter sequences, right? So if you can somehow but you can only do linear regression if you have, or any kind of modeling if you have variation, right? So you need like, your input and output variable. If they're always the same value, you never know how they're related, right? So when things are moving, then you start to be able to see those connections between variables, right? So, so variation in the sequence from gene to gene, the promoter sequence, drives variation in, say, transcription level. So that we can exploit now, try to understand this variation in something that we can measure in terms of uh, something that we sequence this is a prior right? And so, so we've been trying to, evolve, to build models directly from, from non coding sequence using a biophysical description of these interactions between uh, prescription factors in the DNA. Right? And the nice thing about it is you can have like a direct biophysical interpretation uh, of, of those parameters. It's closely tied to the, to the molecules. And so we just want to emphasize this doesn't rely on clustering, right? We're not clustering genes and getting a cluster of co-regulated genes and then looking for say motifs that are enriched in the motors of the genes in that cluster. Uh, that is good for seeing some broad trends in the data, but but you know every gene is as a unique sequence, it, it, right? It provides unique information about the regulatory network. Uh, and the other thing is that clustering doesn't allow you to do is, for instance, predict the effect of SNPs in promoters of genes, right? Because it, it says that this gene behaves like all these other genes. So it's not trying to predict the variation of that gene in terms of its individual sequence. And you know, since we're using sequence to predict something you can measure, it's clear that if like a motif occurrence is correlated with an mRNA level, that that is because this motif influence, right, the direction of causality is from the motif to the expression level. It doesn't have to be 
super direct, right? There could be some steps in between, but at least you know that the direction of causality is from the sequence to the, to the measure. Okay, so just, you know, some of the stuff we've already talked about, just to put that, you know, in perspective. So now let me think about this right now. Right? We've done all this, and uh, what you see here is a curve, like fractional occupancy. You know, here it's from zero to one, right? But if I express it as a percentage, of course, it goes from zero to 100, right? And a concentration of the transcription factor equal to the KD, I get 50% occupancy. And also, initially, this curve is just, it's, it leaves as a straight line from the origin, right? And then it starts to saturate and level up. Um, you may have seen binding curves that look more like sigmoidal curves, something like this, right? So why is this different here? Well, that's because this is as a function of the chemical potential, which is the log of the concentration, right? You turning this x-axis into a log axis, and then it starts to look like this fermi Dirac distribution, uh, right? But, but it's really the same, uh, the same thing. And I know I think it's uh, more intuitive to think about this as like a linear response of the occupancy to the Hashimoto effect concentration. Now, if the cell can tune the concentration of Hashimoto factors, right? What do you think where it would like to be on this curve? What is, what is the good, good level of concentration relative to the KD? Right? Do you want to be over here? Or do you want to be over here? Yeah. Right. So what's going to happen if you know, I'm some cell type and now I you know, sense some change in the environment and I double my concentration? Is this going to have a big effect on the expression of my target genes? No, no right? but you're already fully saturated. It's not going to push it further. It's not going to change anything. Right? Here, maybe the fluctuations are large, or you know, right? So, but if you're sitting around here, the sweet spot, you have the responsiveness, right? This line is still close to the maximum slope, and you have a reasonable level of occupancy, right? So, so people actually looked at this across the different species, and it seems that the cell tries to tune the, the free protein concentration uh, uh, to, to be more or less in range. Right, and then now if I have a mutation, in the binding site, right, so it started from this blue sequence where I have an A at position 2. This is the E box, again, like the binding motif for most HLH. He looks at helix factors like NIC and MyOD, uh, palindrome, the homodimer. If I mutate this A to a, to a T, right, so of course then, because it's still what's a quick base pair, it would be an A on the opposite strand, right? If, if the E box was the optimal, motif with the lowest KD, right? So high best binding is the lowest KD. So if I want to quantify now, like starting to create this lookup table of KDs for all possible uh, Kmer uh, sequences, right? Um, I, it would be most convenient to put the KD of the mutated site in the denominator, right? Because the mutation will make the site weaker, will make the KD go up, right? So it's... Uh, So, where was I? Oh yeah, we'll make the right, binding site gets weaker, so you need a higher concentration to occupy it at the same level. It needs higher KD, right? And then put the thing that gets larger in the denominator that makes the, and this is the reference sequence, right? That we start from. That makes this ratio smaller than one, right? And then we call that W2T, it's the relative affinity associated with the mutation from A to T in position two, right? It's, I'm not putting the A here because this implicit is whatever base gives me the highest affinity, right? That's my reference sequence and then relative to that. I could actually <coughs> mutate this position in a number of different ways at position two. How many ways can I mutate the optimal sequence at position two? Three. Three, right? Not a very hard question. So right? So <laughs> so then <laughs> why? It was just a question. <laughs> Right? So how many possible point mutations are there relative to the uh, uh, to this optimal hexamer? Three times six is what? Eighteen. <laughs> okay. So so that's eighteen parameters, right? Uh, how many hexamers were there? Four thousand ninety-six. Right? Four to the six. So four to the six is a much larger number than uh, than eighteen. Now 
we have to ask ourselves, what happens if I have a, a second mutation to this binding site? Right? And it really depends on whether these base pair positions and the way they interact with the amino acid side chains that are reading their hydrogen bond donor acceptor pairs, whether those are influencing each other, right? And we talked about this independence between base pair, uh, right, in terms of their contribution to to the uh, uh, to the to the to the protein DNA interaction. So if you can assume that the effect of these two point mutations is independent, and then you can actually multiply these fault reductions in affinity, right? It's equivalent to adding up the, the binding free energy, right? So, you know, this uh, KD is, is related to binding free energy difference between the bound and the unbound state. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to use that notation here, but for those of you who know like, what delta delta Gs are, uh, right, you add up the delta delta Gs associated with these two mutations, and you plug it into a Boltzmann factor e to the power, you know, free energy over KT, then it becomes adding up energies is equivalent to multiplying relative probabilities, right? And so that means if I can make this approximation, then I can right, predict the binding affinity of this two mutation sequence from the two individual point mutations, right? Then um, I only need 18 parameters to parameterize four to the six relative affinities. Right, so it's very efficient. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, I show those parameters then as a weight matrix type, type object. So this is actually for an RNA binding protein, so that's why there's a U here instead of a T. But um, what, uh, what we show here is that something that we call, you know, started to call a, a position specific affinity matrix to kind of uh, distinguish it from, the, from these, you know, classification based uh, weight matrix. So, you know, in the frequency matrices that we talked about uh, yesterday, in every column you had four frequencies, F, J, B, that were adding up to one within the column, right? If you sum over A, C, G, and T. Now here, if you look at the numbers, it doesn't add up to one, right? So it's not because I made a mistake, uh, but it's because uh, the ones are the relative affinities associated with the optimal sequence. So remember, right? that's what we call one because we're normalizing everything in terms of the, the KD of the optimal sequence, right? So you could actually read of what is the highest affinity, uh, right? the, the highest KA sequence from here by just seeing where, what basis uh, you need to pick to get ones. And then you multiply all those ones and you get the relative affinity of one, right? So now we make a mutation I uh, say from an A to the C of position 9 here, we're down to 28% of the optimal affinity, right? So this binding site will be bound about, you know, a third as efficiently as an optimal binding site. And if I would have two mutations, like a, I'd have a U at position 5 and a, and a C at position 9, I would get a binding site that's about 10% of the, of the optimal. Okay. So this, again, is about the representation like, of binding specificity when you assume independence between base pair positions, right? you can add up to energy changes or you can multiply the, the, the full changes in affinity. Right? But I haven't told you how you would get the numbers in that matrix. Right? And so this is what we, you know, an algorithm we developed is called matrix reduce. Uh, we basically come up with a way of estimating these relative affinities from empirical data, like expression data or chip data. Uh, and this was a little bit in 2005 when we published this for the first time, um, before like, all the in vitro high throughput data like protein binding microarrays, right? It was a little bit of that, just one or two experiments. But, uh, but here's how the algorithm works. It's, um, and, and you know, one crucial ingredient is that this weight matrix gives you a recipe going from any sequence of length 13 in this case, right, to a number between 0 and 1, right? That's okay. But any kind of genomics data, like chip data or mRNA expression data, right, is not just a 13 mer DNA sequence that, that is the promoter of that gene, or it's, right, it's a regulatory sequence associated with that gene. It's a longer sequence, and we don't know a priori where the binding sites, the locations in those longer sequences are that contribute to whatever we measure, full enrichment in the, in the chip experiment, or say, uh, uh, RNA expression level, um, absolute or relative in, the, in some uh, RNA expression profile experiments. Right, so 
So we need to add another layer to the to the data. We have to to you know account for the fact that we don't know exactly where the binding site is in the sequence. So think you know that these sequences represent like 500 base pair upstream regions of, of all the genes in say in yeast, right? And then this is a chip fold enrichment, so it's immunoprecipitated uh, read density, or you know, or this was you know in these days it was like microarray based, right? But it's proportional. The intensity you get from the array is proportional to the read count in, the, in a HMC experiment, right? And then fold enrich. I'm not taking a log here because biophysically it makes sense that the fold enrichment that is the, the probability, the relative rate at which you pull down a piece of DNA when you use your antibody against the protein, right, is proportional to the probability that that protein was bound to the DNA when at the time that you were cross-linking the protein with the DNA, right? So, so your fold enrichment, you would think, is proportional to this fractional <coughs> occupancy. So no logs, and then one means not enriched, right? The, the you know, input equals the immunoprecipitated in the sample. But then, you know, a sequence that has some good binding sites in it uh, over here will may show a fourfold image. But you know, so other reaches will show an intermediate enrichment, probably because there is a binding site there, but it has a port mutation that makes it not as strong. So, and we want to capture the whole range of affinities when, when we look at these sequences from the point of view of a particular transcription factor. Right? And we're not explicitly here um, bringing in the identity of the transcription factor, right? It's only through the weight matrix, through this binding specificity. It's only we know for which transcription factor we did the chip experiment. So we know, you know, the motif that we get that it has something to say about that factor. Right? Question? Uh huh. So a lot of chip data is based on overexpression. So do you model that? Do you model like overexpression versus uh, native protein? Hold on. Not really, because the uh, the concentration of the nucleus uh, of the protein in the nucleus becomes part of, of the model of it. Right? So we're just, I guess, the factors are overexpressed to, to get above the noise, right? Or, or well, no, because like, you, look, you don't have a good protein and you want um, this antibody. You, 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 I'm sorry, you get an antibody, so you're pulling it down and you're flagged down or something. Right. Or oh, okay, right, right. But then, so that, that could completely change the uh, binding from one experiment to another. Yeah, it's true. So you know, if you, if you can somehow, Insert the flag tag, you know, in a native context, right? Where it's driven by the same motor, but of course that's not usually not possible in like mammalian cells, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, so you have ectopic expression of it, or you know, you put it yeah. in a factory somewhere, insert it in the genome, right? You don't have a lot of control over the expression level. Um, yeah, I mean that that is a problem, right? And and all, even the presence of the tag can change, you know, the way the protein inserts itself in the chromosome. So it's uh, you have to worry about that, but you know, here we're just trying to model where is this tagged first version of the protein that we see, right, at whatever concentration it's at in that cell, and try to understand that in terms of the of the sequence, and you know, then any kind of caveats that you want, to, right? Uh, well, I'm just wondering because there may be data sets where you could compare, for example, native chip versus overexpressed chip. Right. Yeah, that's actually maybe it's a good time to say a little bit about this. Um, the um, um, it's kind of curious, uh, and there's there's this phenomenon that um, the Merkerstein also got that a little bit. There is um, there's a phenomenon in chip data that uh, there are loci, right, that are, that are bound or at least give a high chip enrichment for lots of different chip effects, right, which is Still, the jury is kind of out to what extent it's some kind of artifact and it's chromatin structure and it's been specific protein protein interactions. Uh, so actually, I had a paper with Bosman Stainsel and Kevin White in 2006 where we first saw this in Drosophila cell line. Uh, we call it hot spots of tributary binding. And so this has been found also in the ENCODE project and all that. Right? They call it hot regions, HOT uh, regions, high occupancy uh, transcripts, but um, uh, and it's it's a curious uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, and now getting to your question is like, if you would do see people do expression profiling, they always have a reference state, and then right they do RNA seq one sample, and then they expose it to a drug or something, or RNA on some gene or whatever. 
right? And then do it again, and then look at differential expression between those two cell states, right? For the same uh, genome-wide expression profile. Uh, not a lot of people do differential chip, where they say do chip on some cell state, unperturbed cell state, and then the RNAi factor of interest or, or overexpress it specifically, and then do it again, and then look at differential occupancy across the genome, right? Because if you would do that, all those hotspot -like sites that are right, occupied by the protein but not because they're direct targets, but because of somehow the fact that they're close to the DNA because of the chromatin structure, those would hopefully drop out, right? And, uh, so, um, you know, you occasionally see uh, studies that do this and more and more, but it's, you know, by and large, right, it's like all the chip is like absolute expression-like profiles, right, but, but no differential expression. So I think it would be good to general to the chip to always try it. If you, if you look at some drug response or if your design is naturally a time series or something, right, you may already have multiple samples you can compare, but if you're just doing one chip profile, um, you, you may not have that luxury of doing a differential analysis. This is all. This is this is just uh, absolutely original. It's just you know some tag, MIG tag, transcription uh, factor protein, uh, and then it was pulled down and full enrichment over here. Right? So this is not this is what we find kind of set up, which was just uh, mentioned. Okay, so what we'd like is a model that I can plug in one of these sequences and I get out one of these numbers. Right, or at least something that's reasonably close to it. So I'm trying to predict well, some kind of model for, for this chip from the original in terms of the, of the, the, the local sequence. Right, so some stretch of the genome, if you look at it from the point of view of a particular chip effector, if you would know the sequence specificity, if you would have a position-specific affinity matrix on that, uh, of that factor or, or a more fancy model, um, right, you could slide a window base pair by base pair, right? and then every time you use your weight matrix to compute, to predict the relative affinity, most of the times, you know, you pick small numbers from all these columns, it will multiply to something really small, right? Uh, but once in a while you get like a perfect match to the optimal sequence, or maybe you get something that's one point mutation away, and you would get the relative affinity score here of one and point thirty six here. Now if you think of the chip fold enrichment, you know, these multiple motifs, um, to first order, they just contribute independently to the to the to the fold enrichment. Right? The, the factor now has two places to interact with this region through here or through here. Right? So so you it doesn't make quite a physical sense to just add up these two numbers one and 0.36. Right? You get now a predictor that's 1.36. Right? And, and you would think that somehow this fold enrichment. Uh, in that right column would be proportional to the sum of these affinities. Uh, so this shows what this actual, you know, single base pair resolution affinity profile, you know, derived from this weight matrix and some promoter region looks like for some gene in yeast. You see, there's only only two places where it's really significantly different from zero. Right. So yeah, this is my predictor, and now I can, again, assuming that I would know the transcription factor. The wave matrix, right? I could use this to predict, to, to, to construct a predictor for the fold enrichment. And these numbers are not yet these numbers. There's some scaling factor in between them that I don't know, but I can fit as a, as a model parameter, right? And so that's really what, what, what is shown here in this scary formula. This is like a, a sum over all promoter regions. If I'm now trying to fit this wave matrix, right, um, to the chip fold enrichment. Given the, the sequences, I would, within each binding window, I would multiply these Ws, this is product over positions within the, the window, and then I would sum over all the window positions within that one promoter sequence. And then I would scale that sum by some coefficient that's the same across all the promoters, some slope, right? And that would be a prediction of this fold enrichment, and then I want to minimize the difference between the model projection, you know, to the right of the minus side and the, and the actual measurement across all the promoters. And it will give me the weight matrix coefficients, and then also the slope, et cetera. But, but those slopes are not so interesting. I would really do this to, to get these uh, these uh, affinity parameters. So I missed, where does the predictive affinity come from? It comes from sliding, let's say I have some weight, guess of the weight matrix. Okay. And I would slide that across every promoter sequence. 
and then the sum of the affinity score across that region, that would be the predictor. And now I can, of course, move my Ws right to, to get closer to the actual uh, chip profile. So this is an algorithm that uh, we call matrix we use. And uh, this shows the actual scatter plot of the, you know, this is a weight matrix inferred for some Trishipa factor. Right? And these are the sliding window sums across each promoter. Every point here is a different gene, a different promoter region. And then these are the fold enrichments of this factor. This is, you know, one, so not enriched. And then there's a whole range of fold enrichments. So you see it's really quantitative, right? And then you can capture a lot of this variation in the y-axis, the fold enrichment, you know, from position to position across the genome, <coughs> in terms of the in vitro uh, binding affinity between this protein and, uh, and, the, and the, you know, this regional sequence. Okay, and then, of course, you know, if you're wanting to understand why does a particular protein have this kind of sequence preference, right, and uh, that involves things like looking at the amino acid sequence and looking at structure, you know, these are all the C alpha as of side chains that are recognizing a particular base pair here, seen from two views. But this kind of data, you would see if you could use that to, uh, to make predictions. We're, we're trying to you know, do that, but you know, it's, it's a hard problem. People are trying to work with this It's a nice picture, made by Sean Lewis. Uh, um, okay, so this uh, wraps up one section of the uh, of my talk. I think over a little longer before we break in the 15 minutes. Or so. so now, so so far I've explained to you how we think biophysically about sequence specificity, right, and how you parameterize this in a in a way that makes biophysical sense. And then I was showing you how you can, if you have some kind of measurement across lots of different sequences that varies because the sequence varies, but right? you can, from these pairs of sequence of measurement, you can learn the, the parameters of the square vector. And you know, I was showing that for chip data, but you can also use in vitro protein by the microarray data, or even mRNA expression. Actually, the first application of this algorithm is we just look at mRNA levels and then we try to infer motifs that were predictive of the changes in gene expression that we see between two, uh, two cell states. And there, of course, we wouldn't know what is the protein you know, whose binding specificity is modeled by the motif you would have, right? Because it just changes in expression. You don't know which hyperactors are going up or down. But as I said, if you do a chip experiment or a protein binding micro experiment, you tag a specific protein, right? And, and so then you know that the motifs that you get out of it is tied to a specific protein. So it really depends on the context of uh, how you do this. And you know, so let's say you would derive a motif from the chip data, right? Um, you could then use it to interpret mRNA expression level changes to see, you know, was this motif relevant you know, for the changes in expression that I see in my expression condition? So that's kind of the question that we're going to ask next now is, is um, can we somehow, if we have prior information about what are the targets of a particular trishipa factor? Can we um, can we exploit that prior information to interpret genome-wide expression levels uh, and go somehow from the level of RNA and genes and their individual RNA levels to the level of uh, transaction and trishipa factors and their protein level activity? Okay. So just a, a cartoon of what we what this is about. Is like, you know, a typical gene has binding sites for multiple Trishipa factors, right? So the different colors are different Trishipa factors. Right? It's a many-to-many -many mapping uh, from Trishipa factors to, to genes. Uh, and that makes it hard to, right, to, to just look at the expression of some gene and, and infer from that what the activity of a Trishipa factor is. If we would have ideal uh, reported genes where this is a P53 binding site and this is an AP1 and this is a NIC binding site, right? And, and there's nothing else. If we would strip the basis of the DNA uh, somehow, right? And then we measure the expression, we would know that's proportional to the concentration of that factor in the nucleus. Of course, that's impossible to do, right? So you could either um, try to construct some reporter that's very specific, or you could say, well, I can kind of, kind of you know, deal with this many-to-many -many relationship with some kind of linear model, for instance, in the computer, right? And try to decouple all these, all these contributions from different computer factors. 
to the expression of all these genes. Right? So this is hard to do experimentally, but it is actually relatively easy to construct something like this computationally from the data if we have prior information about where the binding sites. Like what are the the strength of all the motifs, uh, different factors in the promoter of every gene. So if you want to think about this in terms of a network, you know, we, we have the mRNA expression level uh, of the genes, and um, right, I'm using the red and green uh, color scheme here for up and down and no change, right? So measuring RNA analyses. Between two conditions, some reference condition and some test condition, right? And then yellow up and blue down the color scheme for shipping factors is the protein level uh, activity of the shipping factors. Really, you know, the concentration of the functional form of that molecule, the protein molecule in the nucleus. And then there's a third color scheme here is the strength of the arrows between the, the regulators and the targets, which basically is the sum of these sliding window affinities in the promoter. Weak binding site for factor two here. And this is three, three bytes more weakly to the promoter of G2 than to the promoter of G3. Okay. And these were the hidden activities, right? We're sitting in Plato's cave and trying to, to, to somehow infer those rather than measure them. Okay. Now, so this, I was talking about how bad that we're going to make this horrible approximation of you know, one protein uh, binding to DNA by itself, even though there's all the nucleosomes and all the other factors. So, so this states that explicitly. We make this wild assumption now that the transcriptional response to a change in the nuclear concentration of some transcription factor right, is proportional to just the in vitro promoter affinity of, you know, for, of that factor, um, which I can predict with this weight matrix that I can follow. Right? So it's pretty good at, at quantifying how binding strength varies with DNA sequence, but of course it's very, it doesn't at all try to capture competition or cooperativity between different ship factors or nucleosomes and you know, all that stuff. But again, you know, even though the strength of this arrow for, you know, predicted from the genome sequence is pretty far off from maybe from in vivo how responsive this gene's uh, expression level is, right, um, I'm making a mistake for every individual gene, but I'm not trying to predict these levels from the yellow and blue levels, I'm trying to go the other way. I'm trying to go from many genes and their expression levels, like here, gene 2 and gene 3. I'm trying to infer the activity of transcription factor 3. So I could hope that my imperfections in these arrows somehow average out. I'm still capturing something you know, essential about what are the targets of, of this transcription. So now we're back to the same kind of situation as before, but now here on the right, this is not a vector of fault enrichment from a chip experiment uh, across all promoter regions, but it's the actual log ratios of mRNA expression changes between the red and the green conditions in here across all the genes. Right? And uh, these are the genes that are driven still by the same promoter region. So there's still the promoter regions of the genes. Now it's the expression level of the genes. And if I now have a predefined weight matrix that allows me to predict for every promoter the sum of sliding window affinities, as before, right? Um, now I can use that, these affinities, right? So Y means there's no binding site here, there's a good binding site here, there's a weak binding site, right? I could now assume that the response of gene expression up, the red or green down, could be proportional to the strength of the binding site, right? And then now, so, so what would the slope between, so this would be the x-axis now, right? It's the predictor put on the x-axis, right? It goes from zero to, well, not one, because there could be multiple binding sites, but like zero to a couple, right? And most of the genes will have something close to zero, but then there will be quite a few genes that have the hundreds that have a binding site or, or half a binding site. And then this is the y variable, where it just changes expression up and down, right? And, and so. Um, so this next plot is showing a fit to an actual scatter plot for some real expression data here, right? You see, there's lots of genes that don't show a change in expression and that don't have a binding site. But then there's a statistical trend of um, 
between you know the strength of the affinity integrated over the promoter region for instance, every point is a G right? and the change in expression. Here the trend is negative, so the more binding sites I have in the promoter, the lower the expression is in the new condition compared to the reference condition. So what would that mean? Would that mean that uh, there is transcription factors can be activators or repressors? Does this tell us something about whether this factor is an activator or a repressor? Yeah, because it's negative, right? Now, it's not quite as simple, because um, what if I have an activator that's sitting in the nucleus in my reference condition, but then in my test condition, it leaves the nucleus, right? So I have a reduction in the concentration of that factor. And then, so it means the genes that have a binding motif, they were getting a contribution to their transcription from the nuclear presence of the factor. But you're losing that in the new condition, and you get a decrease in expression. So you have to be careful to interpret the negative slope here as, as a repressor, right? Um, it, uh, you, it's, it really depends on the, on the, on the circumstance. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand. So you could do this with any expression experiment from any condition. It doesn't, it's not related to the transcription factor directly. It's just indirectly right. inferring. Yeah, so it, well, this axis depends on how you define that, right? Here right. you could use any genome-wide expression profile. This, this axis, um, you could multiple, you could use multiple things as a predictor for the changes in expression. Here, I've, I've, I have this kind of sequence derived, you know, motif score as a predictor. So I'm using a weight matrix, a specific weight matrix, there to define the x-axis. You know, so then I have but still, um, you could, you could, for instance, use chip fold enrichment as a predictor. For we've done that. In Right? And then see if you can, the, the chip profile in some reference condition predicts the changes in expression that you see in some other conditions. There's caveats associated with that, with, you know, yeah. other kinds of caveats. As, you know, with the I'm just curious why the maximum of X, XCC is in the Well, so in this case, apparently, the, there's no optimal match to the weight matrix in the genome, which is, you know, for larger weight matrices that, you know, make lots of context, it's maybe not a good idea to have optimal sites in the genome because you would never get them off, right? So but if you have a, your favorite transcription factor, they should have a specific target of genes that they have very high affinity. Well, according to the textbook, <laughs> but according to biophysics, it doesn't, you know, it's more of a continuum. I think this is much more realistic than to say these are the targets. And these are not the targets. How is the, the, the like point one, the perfect matches derived if you have a normal transcription factor? Well, you would still see this is, you get a weight matrix that predicts affinity for any kind of sequence. You can, even if the optimal sequence doesn't occur anywhere, you could still infer the parameters of that weight matrix. Right? From because you would still model the trend between the affinity and the response. By the way, you know, there's an optimal side, we call that one, right, in terms of <coughs> affinity. Um, what, what do you think is the relative affinity of the worst possible side that you could imagine? Zero. Zero? Yeah. But then, you know, about half of the contacts between the transcription vector and the DNA are with backbone of phosphates. There's this nice strong interaction, it just doesn't change if you change the DNA sequence. So it means that the free energy difference between like the optimal sequence of energy lower is better, right? So the optimal sequence and then the worst possible sequence is still, it's not all the way up there, right? It's, there's still the backbone complex. And then if you plug that into a Boltzmann factor, there's some full you know, difference in affinity between the best and the worst possible side. That is actually on the order of maybe 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 6. It depends on, on the factor, right? But it's not. Uh, zero. And what does that mean? Let's say it's 10 to the minus 3, right? Or even 10 to the minus 4, let's say 10 to the minus 4, right? Um, how long is a typical human gene? Like uh, over what uh, region does it spread? Uh, yeah, so yeah, in the order of 100,000, right? So now, if the dump specific binding affinity is 10 to the minus 4, it means that 10 kb of DNA, right? 
is as good as recruiting the factory that is one optimal biomass. So if you look at it from that point of view, every human gene has starts with having 10 binding sites for every eight possible to human. Right? And then so and there was all these papers about about the you know, chip on uh, on say uh, different human treatment factors, and there were thousands of binding sites, and it was a big shock, you know, from a biophysical point of view. In a way, it's more uh, striking that not every gene is a target of every transcription factor. Right? The fact that you can have enough cooperativity, specificity with the nucleosomes and transcription factors forming complexes, you really have to overcome this kind of huge right, uh, uh, tendency to, to bind everywhere. Um, so this axis, you know, the, the random sequencer is somewhere at 10 to minus 3, right? Point 1 is a very high affinity site compared to this background binding. Right? And I think those are definitely physiologically relevant. Well. Um, right? So it's not just having the perfect matches or one mismatch in way that, that, that necessarily are physiological well. Now, in the case of this chip data, right over here, there was a pretty good R squared around 50%. Um, here, the typical R squared, the fraction of the variance in the y axis that we can explain with this kind of sequence based model, is just one or two or three percent. Now, that's, um, now the, there's a glass half full and the glass half empty, right? There's, uh, the glass full is, is 100% R squared, right? But now, an empty glass, like if the null model, like what R squared do you expect for random data? It's essentially one over the number of data points, right? So if we have 10,000 genes, it's 10 to the minus four, right? So an R squared of 1% is still 100 times what we expect by chance, right? So you really have to, Take that as a reference point for these R squared. Um, so yesterday, Mark Gerstein was showing great R squareds, right, for predicting gene expression, and uh, he's a lousy one or two or three percent R squared, right? So it's from. So, so just keep in mind that here we're trying to do something very ambitious: is try to explain expression variation from the variation in the sequence, right? We're not using any kind of measurements in between, right? And if you build a model from going from histone modifications. Uh, chip data to expression level, you're in a way measuring things already pretty much downstream of, of that whole sequence of molecular events. It's very useful because it tells you how variation in these chromatin modifications relate to the variation in expression of all that, right? But it's a different kind of question that, uh, that you're asking. So, so if you get these kind of R squareds, uh, they're not necessary to be uh, discouraged. Uh, and so just to wrap up before the break, uh, just want to talk about uh, analogy. You know, we have the transcriptome, right, the RNA levels, and then we have the, the genome, like non coding genome, uh, right? And so if you think of the RNA levels as a response to um, to some kind of, you know, uh, regulatory control parameter like a, uh, like a trip effector, you can think of an analogy with uh, electricity, uh, current and voltage, right? So this is Ohm's law, it's the you know, linear relationship between uh, and, you know, binding affinity, which is like the conductance of some wire, right? And then the current is proportional to both the conductance of binding affinity and to the voltage that's driving this current, which is the change in the activity of the pressure And, you know, uh, we've actually tried to validate some of these predictions that is, we are inferring changes in the activity of the chip effector from the RNA levels. What this shows is, we actually look at the GFP labeled version of some uh, to ship factor here, um, and uh, it's it's a little hard to see here, but what you see here is here this labeled uh, to ship factor called crazy one um, is diffused, it's sitting in the cytoplasm, but then you see these spots here that those are the crazy one going to the nucleus, and then it stays in the nucleus. This is a time course, zero minutes, five minutes, fifteen, etc. Right? Response to uh, calcium chloride, so calcium urine stress. This is a to ship factor that's the downstream of the calcium pathway, right? Now, this is a different type of stress. Looking at the same GFP labeled or super factor, here it's sitting in a cytoplasm. After five minutes, when it's gone nuclear with this other stress, it's still in the cytoplasm. Still 50 minutes, only after half an hour do we see this nuclear localization. Right? And now what you see here on top are, are inferred activities of crazy one across the same time course. Like Genome-wide expression data. We're using knowledge about the targets of crazy one here. And what you see is the red curve is the curve corresponding to this stress over here. 
goes up right away, right? Five minutes and then it kind of stays up, consistent with this different localization. And then over here, it takes 30 minutes to respond to the stress, which is exactly what you see in this curve. So instead of having to GFP label your Schuper factor and uh, microscopy on, on cells, just looking at the RNA data, you can actually make these kind of inferences. Uh, of course, you know, it depends a lot on how good your annotation of the targets is, right? Uh, but, uh, but in principle, it's possible to do this kind of inferring, inference of, of protein level variables uh, from genome-wide expression. Because the final plot I was saying that you know the RNA level of um, of a transcription vector is not always a good predictor of its post translational protein level activity. This shows across like hundreds of expression profiles the RNA level of the crazy one gene versus the inferred protein level activity of, of crazy one as a as a transcription vector. You see there's very little correlation here. It's, it's pretty typical for these kind of you know, factors that, that respond to external uh, All right, um, I think I'm going to wrap up here for today in terms of the lecture, and we'll take a short break, and then we'll meet across the hall, and we'll go through a tutorial, and I'll give a short introduction about what we're doing here. Okay.